the Torah, Parshat Noach, the story about Noah. So last week I set the intention, we set the intention about reading a Genesis and the power of particles. If we remember, we studied just about that little word et, right? That has no meaning really, but has so much meaning and how we can experience the world through a particle. Tonight we learn from Noah. No sooner do we learn about creation and the world and humanity that we hear that God wants to destroy the world, destroy humanity. And we're left with why. Perhaps we're not living up to our best selves. Perhaps we're not aware of how interconnected and dependent we are on all of us, the whole world. In comes Noah. And our text tells us that he's a righteous one. He's a, he's a righteous man in his generation. Tzadikaya bedorotav. That he's wholehearted. He's a tzadik. He is one who lives to a justice-centered life. One who's doing the best that he can. And so while there's debate about the overall character of Noah and the trajectory of his life, we learn from the beginning that he stands out as someone who is striving to live up to the highest ideals of what it means to live an ethical life. So God tells him to build an ark and save himself and his family and animals. Come unto the ark, go into the ark, God tells Noah. And so they do, and water drowns the earth. Now in constructing this ark, God says, Sohar ta selateva. Make a tsohar in the ark. Now I'm not translating this word yet, because it's a word that happens to appear only one time in the Bible, which is called a hapax legomenon. One of my favorite words about studying Bible. And so while last week I focused on one little word, et, that is the most prolific word in all, of the Bi in all of Hebrew language, tonight I'm focusing on a word in the Bible that only appears one time. And for me, this one word is a teaching all about Noah, this archetype that exists in each and every one of us. The tzaddik, the one who is always striving to be the best that we can be and recognizing that we're human, so we're imperfect, and always in process always leaving space to learn more. And in the journey of learning what it means to be a tzaddik, God instructs us to make a tzohar for the ark, as if this tzohar holds the key to unlocking our righteous potential. So what is this tzohar? Rashi, a medieval French uh, commentator, he says that some say it's a window and some say it's a precious stone. Well, what is it, Rashi? We have to do a little bit of an investigation, a little deep dive into Jewish lore to see how our tradition understands this word, Sohar. So, Sohar can mean bright or glittering or noon light. We know that in Hebrew, Sohorayim, afternoon or noon, you can hear it. It has the same root word, Sohorayim and Sohar. So, perhaps it has something to do with that. So, Rabbi Jeffrey Dennis teaches us that in this verse, it seems at first glance that it refers to some kind of structural feature in the ark. And so some people translate it so hard as either a roof or a window or a skylight or simply an opening. The problem is we already have words for those. So hard it still doesn't seem to seem to fit in to those structural words, okay? When I say Zohar, you might hear it sounds similar to the word Zohar, which is the central 13th century Kabbalistic text, right, which means radiance, right, or to shine. So different word, but sounds the same. So perhaps there's some connection between Zohar and Zohar having to do with some kind of illumination. Targum Yonatan is an Aramaic translation of the Torah that was written around this, when the second uh, temple stood. Okay, now they say, it says, that perhaps it is a luminous stone drawn out from the primordial river of Pishon in our Garden of Eden narrative. So now we have this idea that maybe it's a stone that shines very bright, and it's a primordial stone, right? It comes, right, right, it's found in, in the Garden of Eden narrative just last week. In a Midrash commentary on the book of Genesis, Genesis Rabbah, we go into it a little bit deeper. During the entire 12 months that Noah was in this ark, he did not require the light of the sun. 
right? And so what happened was he had a polished stone that he put up into the ark, and when it was dim, he knew that it was day, and when it was bright, he knew that it was night. Now even deeper in the Talmud, it talks a little bit more, Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, who is the hero of the Zohar, he comes in and says, Abraham had a precious stone, and he hung it around his neck, which brought immediate healing to anybody who was sick, who looked at it. And when Abraham, our father, our patriarch, when he left the world, God took that stone back and he hung it back over the wheel of the sun. And so the Encyclopedia of Jewish Myth, Magic, and Mysticism, one of my favorite encyclopedias, I recommend it for sure, says this naturally leads to a speculation that perhaps this light, this stone that Noah had, that he placed in his ark, that Abraham had around his neck, was the same thing. So our Talmud in Tractate Chagiga teaches us that Rabbi Elazar says that the light which the Holy One created at the first day, if we remember back, yes, last week in the book of Genesis, God creates light on the first day, but on the fourth day, God creates the sun and the moon. So what's going on? What is this initial light? So the light which the Holy One creates on the first day, one could see from one end of the universe to the other, or one from one end of the world to the other. And as soon as the Holy One beheld the generation of the flood, in the story of Noah, and then the generation of the dispersion, which is about the story of Babel, which we're going to study tomorrow, and he saw that these people were corrupt, he arose and he took the stone and he hid it away. So it's so hard. It's a righteous light. It's an inner light. It's a holy light. And it's a hidden light. A light that would allow us to see from one end to the world to the next, and perhaps this light that was born of creation, hidden in the primordial river Pishon, placed in Noah's ark, passed on to Abraham as a healing amulet, and then hung back up on the wheel of the sun. And now, left for us to seek out, for us to discover, or perhaps for us to rediscover. Perhaps this light would allow us to see that all beings on earth are one family one beautifully diverse family that needs each other to thrive, that needs, that needs each other to really survive. We're all students and we're all teachers on this earth. We have a lot to learn from each other. And so part of my journey is to seek out light in all beings, knowing that all living beings have something to teach. And since this is Parshat Noah, the story of Noah, and it is a reminder of our precious relationship to animals, I will share three of my favorite lessons, which I have probably shared before, that I have learned from animals. We also have a lot to learn from animals. But just for tonight, let's look at the fish, the nautilus, and the phoenix. The fish reminds me of the possibility and the power of transformation and reframing. As Mark Nebo teaches us, by swimming, the smallest fish takes in water and its gills turns that water into the air by which it lives. The question is, what in us is our, are our gills? Our heart, our mind, our spirit, a mix of all three. Whatever it is, like the smallest fish, we must turn water into air in order to live, which for us means turning our experience into something that can sustain us. It means turning pain into wonder, heartache into joy. The Nautilus, it's been around for 500 million years. It teaches us about the spiral of life. Time, not a straight line, not a circle, but a sacred spiral. And in this spiral of life, things happen, suffering and joy. All of it is information. Life is about the experience of balancing suffering and joy, holding them both. The Nautilus does just that. As it grows, it does not do away with the past, doing all it can to forget, but creates a chamber, seals it off, and moves into a new space. If it were to do away with each past chamber as it grows, it would sink. Instead, it keeps its past with it, closes that chapter off, and moves into a new one. And it is this practice that keeps it buoyant, allows it to float, on in the current of life and in the spiral of time. And lastly, the phoenix. The phoenix comes up in Jewish tradition. It teaches us about being selfless and giving. 
Rabbi Joe Hammer teaches us that the phoenix, according to one Jewish legend, is the only creature that never dies. Every 1,000 years, it is reborn out of its own ashes. The phoenix represents life itself and the possibility of rebirth after destruction. The Talmud relays that of all the animals that come into Noah's Ark, the phoenix is the only one that does not ask for food. It restrains its hunger so as to not trouble the exhausted Noah, who has been feeding every animal on the Ark. Noah rewards the phoenix for its compassion by bestowing eternal life. The phoenix also learns through the gift that it realizes its needs are important too. The phoenix teaches us that we can attain renewal as individuals and as a society only through thoughtfulness and moderation of our needs. However, being modest does not mean having no needs. We are always called to investigate the needs and feelings of those around us and to value our own needs, even when that requires asking help from others. The phoenix, which is mortal and immortal, at the same time teaches us to be humble and to value ourselves. So the fish teaches us about the power and possibility of transformation. The Nautilus about how we can hold past and balance suffering and joy. The Phoenix about being selfless and valuing ourselves. We can find fragments of the Tsohar, this hidden light, in all beings. We must. In fact, that is where I believe that Tsohar is actually hidden today. In all of us. Connected through all of us. And our practice is to uncover the Tsohar, this luminous light that rests within each and every one of us. In order to do this, Mark Nebel reminds us there are three things that we should remember along this journey of uncovering the Tsohar. One, it's rare to be alive. Two, there's a common living truth at the center of all things. And three, we are all connected to everything. We are stronger, gentler, more, real, more resilient, more beautiful than any of us can imagine. And the resource we call life is never far away. And so as the waters rage around Noah, and as we continue to hold space for each other in the arc of our community, may we, may we be reminded that though the waters are rough on the surface, just below the surface, the waters are still and the waters are calm. Just below the surface, the Tsohar, this luminous gem, rests within ourselves. So my blessing for you, and I hope you bless me back, is that may we all do this holy work of seeking the luminous within ourselves and each other. Shabbat Shalom. We come back and we seal the deal with a prayer from the sanctuary of the earth. Page 71, may the words of my mouth Right.